Well, let's talk about approaches to church reproduction. Pioneer church planning means you're going in where there's no church, really, and you're starting from scratch. When we talk about church reproduction, we're talking about an existing church that wants to be a part of starting another church, either in its locality or in the region. So how does an existing church move towards starting other churches? And again, there's a couple of different ways that this can happen. Now, the most common is simply what we sometimes call cell division or the mother-daughter church plant. In other words, you have an existing church. Maybe this church has 150 members, and they choose to say there's, maybe there's 20 members that live in this part of the city, and we will send out those members. And so sometimes it looks sort of like this, if I can use the blackboard. Let's say the main church is in the center of the city. And they have a small group that meets here. They have a small group that meets here. Small groups that are meeting around the city. By the way, this is another one of the advantages of the cell group approach, is that you've already got small communities of believers that are meeting regularly and are a small spiritual family. So this church may have small groups spread around the city that are meeting together for their celebrations in the central church. Well, let's suppose there's a community out here where maybe there's three different small groups. And all these people are commuting back and forth to attend church here. And you say, you know, we've studied this, this community out here, and we've determined that there are not very many churches. Maybe there's no church out in this community where these people live. So what we will do is we will take the people who are in these groups and we will form them into the core of a new church. So this basically, this church will send out these people to become a new church here. And that becomes your launch team to start the new church. So this is a fairly common way. In fact, it's probably the most common way to start churches and to start churches that are fairly healthy and have a fairly good survival rate. Why is that? Well, for one, they all come from the same mother church, so they all are going to have the same idea, the same church ethos, the same doctrine. They've been worshiping together here. It doesn't mean that the new church will do everything exactly the same way that the mother church did but there's at least a commonality, a common vision. They also have the advantage of the leadership in the mother church. In other words, as they're getting started out here, uh, they may have questions that the mother church can help them with. The mother church has resources. So let's suppose uh, that this church wants to rent a building to meet in. The mother church may have financial assistance to help do that. Let's say they're going to have an evangelistic campaign and they need assistance of people that will come and help them with the program. Maybe they need musicians or maybe they need people to, to go door to door. People in the mother church can come out. They can help them do with their evangelistic projects. Also, when you do the mother-daughter church for several months, these people may be meeting together to develop their vision. They may be meeting together to do planning. You can long-term plan this new church. Who's going to be the person who does children's ministry? Who's going to be the person who leads worship? Who's musical? Um, who's good with finances to, to do the financial? And so basically you're, you're setting up the whole leadership ministry team of this church before you even launch it. Now, when we started the North Munich Church, it was a daughter church of the Central Munich Church. And that group actually met for a whole year before really launching and starting church services in that new part of the city. And so the mother-daughter concept, um, as I mentioned uh, in one of the earlier lessons, we took several key leaders, an elder, a couple deacons, musicians. We took them to start the daughter church. And so we had a strong team and that church took off fairly quickly. We were able to do sort of almost a launch large, wasn't real large, but 
we were able to launch that church with worship service, with good music, with an attractive program, and we rented space. Uh, originally, we rented space in a hotel, a conference room in a hotel, and there was a, a room that we could do children's work with. Eventually, we outgrew that. Um, but that's one way with the mother-daughter church plant. A couple things to keep in mind when starting a daughter church. Sometimes, just like in real parent-child relationships, the mother can be overly dominant. In other words, this church needs to eventually develop to become its own church. It needs to develop its ministry to reach that community the way they see it's necessary. And sometimes the church and the mother church can be overly dominant and controlling. Sometimes it goes the other way around, that the mother church sort of says goodbye and uh, we'll not see you again. It's sort of like you're on your own now and there's not enough help coming from the mother church. And so this daughter church can sometimes feel like it's been left alone. I mentioned that sometimes the pastor of this mother church will be the pastor of the daughter church for a time. Uh, this happened also when in Munich they started a church in the south and the pastor, he would, he would actually preach earlier in the morning here, get in his car, it was about a half hour drive, and then he'd come and then he'd preach in this church here. And so he was preaching really in both churches for I think about the first year or so. And then finally, this church had grown enough they were able to call a pastor. In fact, when they called the pastor, he was half time here and half time in the mother church. And then eventually he became full time here. And so there's a lot of different variations the way this mother daughter approach to church planting uh, can happen. And it's one that we certainly recommend. Now, later on, we're going to talk a little bit about this idea of how, uh, well, actually, right now, let's go into some of the detail about how one of the churches in America has gone about this in a very effective way. And that is a Hill Country Bible Church in Austin, Texas. Now, that church this uh, you can see here is sort of a, a map of the city, and this is from their web page, uh, 2013. And these would be all the daughter churches that this church has started since uh, 1986. So you can see here they have been very active in planting daughter churches, 22 daughter churches. And they've developed a system where they're actually training their own church planters in what they call a church planting residency in that home church. And several larger churches in America are doing this where they literally have a church planting training program. Uh, often these programs go for a whole year. Students uh, who come into that training program already have their theological education. So they're really just geared to learning how to plant a church. And they have a couple principles they've emphasized. For example, from gathering from the church to gathering from the community. In other words, they would say, this approach here would be gathering from the church because you're looking for people who already attend the church that live there. But what they were advocating is saying, look, don't do it that way. They would say, just take a smaller group from this church, a few people who become the core. And so instead of sort of hiving off maybe 40 or 50 people, they say send out a smaller missional team and then the church is really recruited from people in the community from new believers in the community. They said, if you hive off, you just take a chunk of this church and move it out there. These people that you send out, they may not be very missionally oriented. They might be saying, well, uh, we don't want to drive as far to church on Sunday. But their passion is not really reaching new people for Christ. And so their theory is, you just gather the new church from people in that community. In fact, one of the things they do is when their church planners are in the training program, 
for them to, so to speak, graduate from that training program, they have to have made many, many contacts with unbelievers, personal relationships with unbelievers in this community. So they have to demonstrate their ability to relate to people in the community. So that's a key that they have found. From transplanting to transforming, instead of not, not just sending out 20 or 30 people, but saying, we want to actually transform that community that we send them to. Instead of saying we want a critical mass, we want a missional core. What does that mean? Many times it's been said in church playing, well, if you don't have at least 30 adults, or if you don't have at least 50 adults, and different people will give you different numbers, 100 adults. They say if you don't have at least this critical mass of, say, 50 adults, well, then the church it may not survive, it may fail. And so you need this critical mass. And they're saying that's not the right way to think about this. It's not the number of people you start with. It's the kind of people you start with. Now, I call this the Gideon principle of church planting. Remember the Bible story of Gideon? And uh, they're going to go up against the Midianites. Bad people, right? Powerful army. How is Israel going to take on this terrible foe? And they start out with a general call. 30,000, more than 30,000 soldiers. Wow. That's a lot of so big army, right? And God says it's too many. Send the faint-hearted home. 30,000 down to 10,000. Now, if I'm Gideon about this point, I'm going, whoa, 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 whoa. We're supposed to have a big army, right? Not a little army. And then what does God say? No, it's still too many people. Remember the story? He says, go down to the river and watch how they drink water. You know, if they lap like a dog or how they drink water. Send away those ones. Now they're down to 300. Now, I like the idea of an army with 30,000 more than I like the idea of an army of 300, right? But it was the right 300. And that's my philosophy, and that's their philosophy of church planning. You don't want just numbers of people. You want people committed. You want people with a passion for lost people without Christ. You want people who can build relationships in the community. You want people who are going to be willing to sacrifice for that church plan, because that sets the tone. That sets the DNA of that church. And so those people are committed. They are a core. They're, they're going for it. And when other, than, other people then come, they see that this is what the normal is. This is the way that this church's life is shaped. And so one of the things I did, I was actually pastor in the Central Munich Church for a year before we launched the North Munich Daughter Church. And what we did is we're beginning to make plans for that daughter church. And uh, this was a church that had about 300 adults attending. And we had an open information evening. We said, anybody who's interested in, in this church plant, we're thinking of planting a church in the northern part of the city, come on to this. Everybody's welcome to come to the information evening. So this is sort of like our 30,000. And uh, so, you know, a lot of people come and I, I shared the vision and I made it very clear. Now, if you share that vision and you choose to come, this is going to be hard work. It's going to be demanding sacrifice. Everybody's going to have to work. Everybody's going to have to be committed. It's going to be a long time before we have a fancy youth program. We may not have a choir. We may not have all those things that this mother church has. We are going on this for one reason, to reach people for Jesus Christ. And we want to reach people who would not ordinarily go to church. And that means we're going to get people with all kinds of problems. We're going to get divorced people. We're going to get homosexuals. We're going to get alcoholics. We're going to get maybe former prostitutes, who knows? We are going for the people who Jesus would go after, the lost people. Jesus said, remember, he said, it's not the healthy that need the doctor, it's the sick. So that, that's, we're going after those kind of people. Now, if that's your vision, if that's your commitment, you come on board. But if that's not what God's leading you, that's fine, stay in the mother church. And so our number went down to about 30 people. 
But that was the right 30 people to launch that church because they knew the vision. And later on, then when we start getting some of these kind of people with all these kinds of issues in their lives, they knew that's what we were expecting. And when we didn't have all the fancy programs, they knew that they'd have to be patient, that those programs were not our number one priority. So critical mass is not the concern. Missional core is. Now another point that uh, the folks in Hill Country have emphasized, they found out that it's more important to help that church plant be creative in raising the financial resources than for the mother church to just give them financial resources. Now, very often what happens is the mother church says, well, we'll start this church, this daughter church, and we will pay the salary of the pastor for the first year, or we will pay all the rent. And um, basically they provide all the financial needs of that daughter church for the first year or two or however long it takes. But what they found at Hill Country is that actually the church plants do better when the church planter has to find creative ways to raise funds for that church plant. Now, why is that? It's because, for one, that church planter has to develop the skills of encouraging people to give, to be committed. He has to inspire confidence for people to give money. So as he's raising up his own team, are those people committed financially? That's a big thing, because if you're trying to plant a church, but you're not the kind of person that can motivate people to be committed, you probably shouldn't be planting the church. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com. And so, um, uh, creative fundraising, whether it's uh, doing some sort of a, a bake sale or whether it's having uh, personal friends who support you financially or uh, get, recruiting other people to help support you. Sometimes they found local, even local businesses are willing to donate money for certain events and so on. And so finding creative ways, what that means is that the mother church is not limited financially. See, sometimes the mother church will say, well, gee, we can only plan a new church every five years because we just don't have the money to do it any more often. So this reduces that limitation, but it also really mobilizes that church planning team, that missional core, to be committed and to be creative in how they raise funds. And what we have found out is that, say when we planted that church in North Munich, I mentioned that we had, uh, we started out meeting in a hotel. And uh, so we'd only pay, uh, you know, for a couple of hours on Sunday morning. It didn't cost much money. It was a good location. Everything worked out fine. Uh, but we outgrew that fairly quickly. Well, at that point, we couldn't find any other rooms that we could just rent for a few hours. Uh, there was nothing that was really suitable. It wasn't in the, the region of the city that we needed to be in. And so we found out we were going to have to rent regular monthly rent for office space that we would convert into uh, a church, a worship center. And that was expensive. City of Munich is very expensive to rent. And so it was a question of the commitment. Now. We could have went back to the mother church and said, oh, woe is us, we don't have enough money. Will you please give us money so we can go rent something? We didn't do that. By that time, we had grown. We had probably 50 committed adults. And we said, now, folks, God has called us to this ministry. God's blessing this ministry. We're seeing people start to come to Christ. Are we willing to make the commitment financial commitment necessary to go and rent the larger space. And, you know, we, we had commitment cards and so on to be able to determine how much people were willing to commit. And we raised the money because they were committed to doing it. And it was a step of faith. And that demanded a step of faith. We, you know, we didn't know if we'd make it or not. But God blessed that because we were willing to take a step of faith. It wasn't unreasonable, it wasn't outrageous, but it was a step of faith. And it was a sign of commitment. And again, that set the tone in the church. This is going to be a group of people that want this to happen. They're committed to the mission. 
and they're going to do whatever it takes to make it happen. So this was the approach we took. We challenged people in a positive way. We didn't try and make them feel guilty. Well, now, you know, God wants you to give 10%, and if you're not giving 10%, you know, your cat's going to die or something terrible is going to happen to you. We just put the vision out there and said, are you committed to the vision? Jesus has led us this far. Let's not be the ones who fail him. And so God provided for us. And so creative ways of funding that, that increase the level of commitment of the people involved. Sometimes we're afraid to ask for that commitment because we're thinking, well, you know, people are sensitive about money and they don't like to talk about money. But we found that if you present it in the right way, um, that that actually increases the level of commitment of the church. So even in financial matters, from dependency model to a creative funding model, so this is the mother-daughter uh, approach to church planning and uh, people like those in Hill Country have refined it uh, to really make it work better. And others are saying basically the same kinds of things that have done uh, a lot of mother-daughter church planning is this is really the way to go. And this is how you get to reproducing churches more quickly. And um, so we can learn from these examples.